already covered a lot of ground um, regarding Docker and Singularity. I know that maybe you didn't have time to go to the end of the presentation, but a lot of things seems seem to have been covered. So, you know, including, of course, how to run containers, how to use the container registries, so Docker Hub. Uh, most of you have probably pulled a Docker image by now, have run it, deployed it, uh, and I guess, you know, most of you have played also with file mounts um, and various options of Docker. So, you know, initially I thought to, to do a, a kind of a advanced Docker or advanced singularity. Uh, singularity in particular since, I, as Pear mentioned on week one too, Docker is, cannot really used on uh, cannot really be used on uh, high performance computing systems, due essentially to security requirements. Nothing fundam fundamental, but it's more the way the the software is uh, is structured. So, I mean, if you're running on Compute Canada, maybe uh, you know those of you who are doing that on Compute Canada or on their own cluster are using Singularity instead. So anyway, so initially I was planning to do an advanced Docker or Singularity uh, presentation. Um, to, for instance, we could talk about things such as um, how do we start a graphical application from a container? Or how do we build our own container image? You know, what are the good practices to do that? Um, but at the same time, I felt like, you know, at the end of the day, these are well-documented software. <laughs> And I think the most important thing is, you know, to get on board. And, and once you have a first feel, a first experience with it, I mean, honestly, I don't think you need anyone to, you know, look at the options, figure out how, it, how they work, uh, Google things and, and understand, you know, oh, uh, this application is supposed to open a graphical window. How do I figure that out? So it's like both Docker and Singularity are well documented. And I think if we are just talking about using them, um, well, I thought you wouldn't need me for that. Um, so instead, what I what I thought could be interesting is actually to try to demystify a little bit how containers work. And so um, uh, I remember when I first used them, maybe it was in, I was at McGill at the time, it was probably around 2014 or 15. They really felt like magic. You know, you run, you run a Docker image or Singularity image, and Singularity wasn't really around by then, but a Docker image, and suddenly it's like you're on a different computer and you can do any kind of crazy things, uh, your root, so you can install any software, you can break everything, and so, and it's it's not a problem, of course. Um, sorry for the background noise, by the way, my son is uh, practicing his guitar, <laughs> practicing between quotes. <laughs> so anyway, containers, containers, I mean, you know, if, if it's the first time that you've been using them, containers really feel like magic. And so my goal today will be to try to demystify that a little bit and to understand uh, more on the internals of containers and what are the fundamental technologies that make them work. Okay. Practice makes perfect. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So, okay, I have two goals for this morning. Um, the first one is to understand a little bit more how the system works, how a computer works essentially, and in particular, the file system and processes. That's going to be important because there is not really, you know, a way to understand how containers work if we don't understand a bit more how the system works. So I'll assume by the way that you have little to no knowledge of, uh, of the system. So, you know, essentially that you can open a terminal, type comments in there, you know, may, I assume that you have typed LS or CD in the past, but not really that you've looked at the internals of, uh, of a computer. Um, and by the way, so, I mean, this lecture is of course a pretext to uh, know a bit more about containers. And I'm just remembering that maybe I should record it too. Um, sorry for that, how do I, oh no, it's already on, okay, perfect. So thanks to um, the one who did that. So anyway, it, and it's also a pretext to know a bit more your system, you know, like beyond containers, um, you're going to run analysis, which are substantial. We are talking yesterday, you know, 
about in the clinics about one analysis that already exhausts the memory of, a, of, a, of your laptop. This is going to come very fast if it hasn't done so already. Soon you're going to, or you're already probably using sh shared computing servers, maybe share HPC systems. And it's important, well, in my, not opinion, but in my experience, it's important to know these things a little bit, you know, uh, to just not be annoying to other people, for instance. So things like being able to look at how much memory you're using or look at what are the applications, your applications, which are currently running on a shared system. I think these are important things to do just to be a good citizen in a shared environment. So this goal, you know, could also serve that purpose uh, eventually a little bit, of course. Um, and the second one is to, uh, as I said before, understand how containers work. So the way we'll do that, the way we'll try to uh, fulfill our goals for this morning, um, we'll try to build, uh, it's a bit ambitious, but we, we'll try to build our own container engine. So we'll call this marker. And um, so we won't really go into building a full system, of course, but we will run a few common lines that will give us a feel of how a container engine works and using the technologies that actually that Docker and Singularity use. This little penguin will help us a lot. Um, so some of you may know that this is the, uh, the mascot of the Linux system. Uh, just to say that Linux is, uh, containers are very bound to Linux. You know, like uh, in common practice, Linux may be, uh, you know, an OS that only some people use and, you know, for good or bad reasons, by the way. But uh, when it comes to containers, they are really coming from features which are provided by the Linux system. Um, so typically, when I refer, refer to the system or the kernel, uh, I mean Linux. So I mean everything in your computer, which is not an application, essentially. So what the kernel does is, you know, it helps you um, um, open files, uh, launch programs, access your hard drive, you know, access peripherals, uh, all that type of things. It's really the manager of the system and then applications come on top of it. Um, yeah, you can get it, its real name uh, and that should work on a Mac too, by the way. Uh, if you type, type U name in a, in a terminal, uh, it gives you details about what system you're using. So here we can see, you know, the output of that. Uh, so I'm running a Linux system. So that's the Linux kernel. This is my host name. It comes from a time where in my, uh, in the lab where I did my PhD, all the, uh, all the computers had mon monkey names. So I kept that tradition for myself. And this is the version of the, of the Linux kernel that, that I'm using. So Linux has a limited conversation. It only knows system calls. So for instance, you know, and which are typically issued by applications. So your applications or by libraries that are used by your application. So typically when you open a file, uh, you would often, you know, let's say you're doing it in Python. Python would call another, would call another library that will eventually uh, uh, call the system and say, okay, I want this file open and the system will, you know, uh, figure it out and give us um, a pointer to the open file. Okay, so this presentation is a Jupyter Notebook. Uh, for the sake of it, we like Jupyter Notebooks, but Jupyter Notebooks don't really play well with all uh, terminal comments. So I still wrote them, wrote them, you know, in, in uh, code cells, use, like with a, an exclamation mark prefix but I will run most of them in, uh, in my console. And be careful that when you type comments in your console, you really should uh, remove the leading exclamation mark because otherwise they would mean something else. Is everybody okay so far? Maybe click no in the, in the Zoom buttons if you have an issue. Sounds good. All right, okay, so some resources, actually uh, a lot of this presentation is taken from this zine uh, by Julia Evans, and I really recommend to check her work because it's awesome. Uh, she has a lot of, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, summary cards, um, you know, um, illustrations on how Linux, but also other things work. Uh, so some of them are very brief, other ones are more elaborated. And, um, and, and, and she has a great way, I think, to present things. So I really uh, encourage you to check it out. I bought that, that thing for $12. I didn't feel like just buying it for $12 and sharing it, sharing it with all of you. Um, so there is a company license for $200, but I didn't really have time to organize it with Concordia. So, you know, I, I encourage you to, uh, you know, if you're interested to spend these $12 maybe and support her work. I think it's, uh, it's not going to be a waste of, um, of money. Okay, so let's move to our fir the first version of our container engine that we are building. Uh, so we are essentially trying to build a new version of Docker that we'll call Mocker. And uh, in version one, version 0 0.1 it will never don't worry we'll never ever reach a version 1.0 in that scope so version 0 0.1 um we'll try to uh, our first goal will be to essentially deploy a new set of files on the computer okay so typically we will need to have a container image um, and we will want to you know tweak our computer so that everything looks like we have started it in that container image. Um, so, yeah, so uh, preliminary, preliminary words on file system mounts. Uh, so in Linux, but it's also true on, in, in a Mac, uh, file systems are organized all under a root directory, which is called slash. Okay, so if I ls slash, I can see here, you know, all the uh, top level directories uh, uh, which are available in my system, um, and and everything happens under slash. Okay, so directories are really organized in a tree, in a tree in the sense of you know uh, in the in a data structure sense. This tree has a root, and this root uh, is called slash. So all the directories which exist on my computer are children or descendants of slash. Just a second. All right, sorry for the interrupt. So we have under this tree, we have many directories. For instance, if I look at my home directory, it's under slash home slash gator. It obviously it's a subdirectory of slash. Now, uh, there are specific ways to interact or to structure uh, this file system. Uh, this file system is also organized with mounts um, so what's a fine mount? A fine mount is a particular directory that you can append to your directory hierarchy. So if I run this command, I run it, I run it here, so that's fine, but it's exactly the same as in the, as in the, as in the terminal. Uh, by running the df command, I can see all the directories which are mounted as part of my root directory. So I can see I can see here the slash directory. This is my parent directory. Under the slash directory, there is a specific directory called home here, uh, which is mounted mounted here. I have also another mount for the slash temp tmp, uh, which is mounted under slash tmp, etc. So when you look at when you arrive on a new computer, it's a good practice to do that so that you know essentially what's available and where. You can also see what space is available and, and also what file system type uh, these different mounts are. So there are different types of file systems. Uh, TempFS is typically an in-memory file system. So that means that it's actually not writing to any hard drive. It's writing in memory. So that's very fast. That's really useful. However, it's most of the time also very small because memory is limited. And if you reboot your computer, the files there will not survive in general. And there are also other types of file systems. Uh, maybe, you know, just to mention the NFS and Luster file systems, they are network file systems. So when you arrive on an HPC cluster, these file systems are usually larger than the others. And uh, they correspond to 
disks or storage servers which are accessible remotely. Okay, uh, important directories in in the in the file system. So slash bin is it stands for binaries. This is typically where programs are installed and located. So for instance, if I look at the LS program, which is installed on my computer, it's located in slash bin. There is also uh, the CD, uh, you know, all these CD, MKD, like all, all these, uh, let's say, uh, common programs are under slash bin. So that's going to be important because typically when we start a container, we want to replace, among other things, the slash bin directory. Likewise, uh, oops, slash etc, uh, etc, contain important configuration files for the computer, slash lib contain software libraries. So when you install a library, it ends up usually under slash lib. And slash proc, we'll also refer to that later. It contains important information about uh, application mounts and other things managed by the system on the computer. Any questions so far? Sounds good. Okay. So let's move one step further. Um, the first key concept uh, to deploy a container is to actually be able to change the root directory uh, of our computer. Okay, so everything is under slash, there's there are the important slash bin, slash lib, slash, slash, et cetera, and other you know, directories. Well, we'll need to change that. So I will need to change my computer to change the root of my computer so that these directories are overwritten or are replaced. Linux provides a way to do that. Uh, this is through the chroot system call. So that's a system call, but that's also a program that helps us uh, call the system call. I believe it also exists on Mac, uh, but yeah. So what I'm going to do now, I will first um, download one container image between quotes, which is actually just a tar archive, you know, so a new set of files that I want to deploy on my computer and I will just extract it uh, locally. So there you go. I'm using wget, by the way, to do that, or webget. Uh, that's something that can be useful to uh, in your work. And yeah, that's it. The output in the notebook was a, a little bit cut, but we end up here. That's So I, I unpacked the archive, and now in that container root directory, I have, you know, files, uh, which represent a complete uh, file system hierarchy. So I have a bin directory, an etc, a lib, a proc, etc, etc. But for now, of course, nothing has been done, so my computer still looks like my computer. You know, I can still go to my home directory and nothing has changed. Uh, and there comes the, the magic. <laughs> Um, so we can now change the root of our directory to tell to the computer, and I'm going to copy paste that command in the terminal um, to tell the computer. So let's look at what we are doing here. Um, so I'm going to change the root to say, okay, I want the new root to be that container root directory that I just unpacked. And in this new root, I would like to run bin.sh, which is another shell. Okay, so the shell is typically the, the terminal uh, in which I can type comments. We also have to do something else here. We'll have to mount, uh, to mount the proc directory to slash proc. Um, this is for system consideration, for the system to keep working correctly. So there you go. Um, this is my first, this is version 0 0.1 of my, uh, of marker. Uh, I'm now in a ch rooted environment, uh, as we say. So, you know, uh, there's still a slash home because there was a slash home in my container root, but not, but the, this slash home has no Glenker directory because it's, it doesn't look like my computer. I have a new, a complete new set of files. So now when I run ls in this computer, it's actually running ls, the ls that was embedded in my container image, which was my tar file. Uh, if I look, for instance, in etc os release, so os release is a, a file that usually contains information about the operating system that we are running. We can see that I'm running Alpine Linux here. 
which is not what I what I'm running on my laptop. On my laptop, I'm running another version of Linux called Fedora. So really, it looks like I'm using an, another version of Linux, um, another Linux distribution anyway, and it looks like I'm running on a different computer. So there you go. What's a container image? It's just a tar file or an archive containing files. And using chroot, we can actually deploy these files so that uh, they are, you know, um, they, we, we can deploy these files so that the root directory on our computer um, is, uh, is moved there. So it looks like we're running on a different computer and changing the root directory is a key concept of containers. Unless there is any question, there should, it doesn't look like there is. Uh, I'll move to the next version then of our uh, container engine, a tiny container engine called Marco. So the file system is actually only one thing that characterizes a computer. If you, you know, lend me your computer and if I log into it, the first thing I'll, 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 I'll notice is, oh, it doesn't look like my computer because there is a different set of files, of course, but there are also other things that make computers look different from each other. And uh, the next thing is the, the, the list and the type of processes or applications which are running on a given computer. So for instance, on my computer at the moment, I'm running Zoom, I'm running Fedora, uh, maybe I have a few other things open, not quite actually, yeah, Rambox, which is Slack, um, and this characterizes my computer too. And when I want to, you know, when I deploy a container, I want that new container to run in its own world, you know, without having all this clutter, all these other applications running around it. So for instance, if my container wants to start Slack uh, or wants to want to start Firefox, everything should look like, you know, it's a unique version of Firefox that we're starting. Okay, so for that to happen, so to isolate applications, we have to say a word about processes. So processes are running programs on a Linux computer, but also on Mac. Um, how do we interact with them? Um, the main command is PS. So if you type PSAUX uh, in your computer, you'll see a list of programs which are currently running there. Um, so you can see that programs have a PID, a process ID. It's a number, that's how they are identified. Um, these process IDs are completely arbitrary, uh, except that one, PID one, is often reserved for the system, and that's the case here. Um, and you can see too that processes are things that consume uh, CPU or memory. Okay, so you can, using PS, you can see Who's, like what, uh, what processes are currently using your computer. Processes also belong to users. So in the Linux system, we have the root user, which is the almighty user, uh, but often and it's recommended, you would use a, a regular user. So my user is Glator, for instance. So if I do that in a plain console, I can see that some process belong to me and other ones belong belong to root and other ones belong to um, other users. A useful common tool to look at processes is called top, so T-O-P. I didn't quite know how to run interactive things in Jupyter, so I'm doing, I'm doing it here. And th this provides a dynamic view of uh, the processes which are running on your computer. So that's what, what I was referring to, you know, when you're on a shared system, it's a good idea to have top open in, some, in a window so that you can see essentially what you're doing. Okay, so we can see for instance here that you know, the, the Zoom application, the first line is using 170% of one of my CPU. Um, so so you know, this, is, this is the application that's stressing my system at the moment for good reasons, I guess. But when you're on a cluster or when you're, when you're on your lab server, you know, it's, it's easy to start MATLAB and then suddenly you have MATLAB or Python or whatever, you, know, you start an analysis and then suddenly you have 20 processes that eat all the CPU and maybe you kill one, but you know, you left things behind, not everything has been killed. So the machine is still computing for your application that was not properly stopped. 
So I think it's a good practice to do that, to have a top console open, you know, whenever you're doing something, either on your, a bit heavy, either on your computer or on a shared computer, keep, uh, keep an eye on what's going on and what, you, what you're doing. In fact, you may prefer the htop command. It's the same thing. Uh, it's a bit more colorful and easy to interact with. Uh, it's not installed on all systems by default though, so uh, yeah. Okay, so PS, top and htop help us uh, interact with processes. Now, okay, processes are also organized in trees. Um, so a bit similar to, um, to, um, to files if you want. Uh, there's this command called ps3 uh, that shows the tree of processes. So when a process starts, um, it's, it's often, it's, it's always except the first process on your computer, uh, which is a system process, but otherwise a process is always started by another process and the starting process is the parent and the started process is the, the child. So again, I do press ps3 in my console and well, that's just a graphical representation of that. So uh, we can see that my, let's say my own later user processes are on here. So if I look at Firefox, for instance, it must be somewhere. Yeah, Firefox is here. Oh, Firefox was actually started by Jupyter Notebook, which was started by a, a bash console, which was started in a, in a GNOME terminal, which is you know the terminal that I'm using, which was then uh, started by the system. Okay, so uh, Tristan, there's a question for you. Oh, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, maybe it's a naive question. There is no naive question, but how is it possible to use more than 100% of the CPU? Okay, so first of all, I have uh, that's a good question actually. So if you look here, if I look at HTOP, and that's one of the reasons why I like HTOP, so you can see these one, two, three, four, these are actually four CPU cores. So, um, yeah, so a, a CPU is, can actually have multiple computing cores. So, you know, it's a chip on which you can have multiple cores and a process runs on one core. Um, usually it can run on multiple cores, but most processes run on one core. So what, what you can see here actually is that, um, so it's, it's totally possible that a process uses 100% uh, of one core and another. So we are talking about, sorry, a percentage of cores to start with. So as soon as I'm under, uh, in my case, 400%, I'm fine because it means that my system can still can still compute. Um, however, if you look at this load here, you can see that the load is around, is close to five at the moment, which means that, uh, so the load measures uh, actually the, um, the resources that processes are requesting currently. So, and, and that's normalized also, like it's equivalent to percentages. So my load is close to 500%, which means that the processes on my system are requesting in total, they're requesting about five CPU cores. Uh, so my machine is, you know, is, is, is loaded and Zoom is not a stranger to that. Um, so what's happening is that, the, so the system, the Linux kernel actually manages that and it puts processes to sleep, uh, you know, based on priorities. So you can see these two uh, columns here are uh, the priority and the nice column. I mean, let's not go into, uh, into, uh, into details here, but, uh, but they, they are used by the system to, uh, to, to prioritize processes. So in the S column, which is the status column, you can see that some of my processes are actually sleeping. S means sleeping and R means running. So Zoom is really actively running at the moment, uh, but other Zoom processes and Rambots, which is my Slack client, are sleeping uh, uh, at the moment. So yeah, the answer to that is first, it's not a naive question at all. Uh, it's, it's often tricky to figure that out. And second, um, in general, don't worry too much if, you're, if your load is too high because the system will, will, will handle that. Um, of course, up to a certain point, like if my load goes to seven or eight here, then everything will become very slow. I hope it answers your question. Feel free to follow up in the chat, if not. 
Um, okay, so right. Um, so now let's go back to our marker version one, version 0 0.1. So I'm, I'm in my CH rooted environment. And if I look at top, we can see actually that this, this is really not isolated from the rest of my computer. So we can see that the first process here, I cannot really highlight, uh, but uh, the first process is zoom. So from my container, I still see zoom. Uh, so typically, you know, from my container, I could interact with Zoom, including killing, killing it, which would be a really bad idea uh, currently. Uh, but my container can really inter interact with anything else. And that's not something that we, we really would like, you know, like when you're running, um, 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 you know, an external or third party application on your computer, you don't want it to be able to, uh, to, uh, to, um, to, how to say, to, uh, to interact and possibly to kill uh, processes. Yeah, skip that, but I shouldn't have. So an important comment to interact with, um, with processes is kill. Um, so uh, we can send signals to processes uh, and we use their process ID. So for instance, uh, if I do here, if I just get the process ID of my uh, Slack, although that's maybe not super, um, it's maybe not uh, a great idea, but okay, let's, let's, okay, let me, actually, I thought I would do that. So I, I start a Google Chrome um, browser. So here's Google Chrome. And if I do PSAUX grab Chrome, we can see it started a whole bunch of things actually. Um, but we can see, I, I believe that this is uh, the first one. I could do a PS3 to get that. So we can see that the process ID of Chrome is 6904. And if I kill, let me do that uh, while I'm here. Yep. So if I kill this process, we can see that maybe you've seen that, but in the background, my Chrome application disappeared because I just killed it. Okay, so kill is a, and here I believe it, it should be, it should tell me something. Yeah. Um, so the Chrome application was really killed. Kill is actually not only used to kill programs, so it's it's very useful. So typically, you know, you're on an HPC or you're on a, you're on your lab server, you have started a bunch of processes. They all use 100% of the CPU. The load of the machine is rising. You'll start receiving emails from your coworkers saying, "Oh, what are you doing on the server?" Then kill is the right comment. You know, you you PS, you get your processes, you get the PIDs, and then you can kill them one by one to just stop doing that. But kill, kill, kill doesn't, you know, it, it's, it's a general comment to send signals to processes. So there are other, so by default, we, we send, kill sends a, a term signal, a signal called term that essentially terminates the process uh, or ask the, nicely the process to terminate. Uh, but there are also other types of signals that, that can be useful and sent within kill. Okay, so using these comments from the CH rooted environment, I didn't kill from the CH rooted environment, but I could have done so. Um, uh, anyway, I can I can at least stop, and you can see that I can see all the processes we are living in the same PID space. So it's clear that marker version 0 0.1 doesn't provide a complete illusion that we are on a different computer. So how do we go one step further? Um, we want to isolate processes. We want, we want to create uh, dedicated spaces for processes, uh, including dedicated PIDs, you know, a separate set of PIDs. And on Linux, that's called a namespace. So Linux namespaces were introduced, I believe, less than 10 years ago um, as a way to isolate processes, but also other things uh, from the rest of the host. So they are the second key feature to enable containers. So the first one was CH roots, the second one are really namespaces. So namespaces can be created and managed using, sorry, using the unshare command. So unshare essentially means, you know, uh, unshare from the rest of the hosts and if I manage to copy paste, yeah. Um, so I can now exit my, I will now exit my marker v0.1 and I will start my marker version 0.2 uh, as follows. So you'll see that the, the, the 
second part of the command is still exactly the same as before. So I'm, I'm still going to run ch roots because I still want, you know, to, go, to, to run from inside my container image. But now I prefix that ch roots by unshare. Um, and in particular, the P option says, you know, I want to unshare my processes. So that's, you know, there is not much to say about it, you know, except that unshare um, eventually is a system call which is implemented by Linux and provided by the kernel to the applications. So in, in this case, to the bash application that I'm using, to my terminal application. So if I run that and if I type my password right, yep, there you go. So I'm back within my container uh, I'm still in my, I believe, Alpine Linux container. But now if I do top, you can see that uh, I don't see all my all the programs on my computer. Okay, so now forget about killing Zoom or killing Google Chrome from inside the container. Things are really isolated. Okay, I have only three processes, which are quite, which is quite rare actually. Um, you know, usually on a on a host on a let's say. Uh, hardware computer, you have a bunch of system processes that do, you know, everything and, and, and your own user usually has also a bunch of processes to run terminals, to run applications. Here, this virtual computer, this containerized computer has only three processes which have PIDs 1, 5 and 3. Uh, so 5 is top, I'm running top obviously. Uh, PID 1 is actually the first process that was ever started in this in this container and that's my you may recognize here the command that we ran through the ch root um, and id3 is the uh, the shell so bsh that was started in the ch root environment pid number two might have been the ch root uh, command itself which has terminated now okay so that's cool. Uh, we have isolated our processes. We now it really starts looking as if we are on a different computer. Okay. So if I log in here, um, you know, if I'm not told that uh, this is a container, it may take me, you know, a while to realize that there is a host. And well, actually, I guess my best in this indices would be that, you know, we have such a low number of, uh, of processes so that would tell me something but it would be tricky for me to understand you know what is the host uh, and, and in particular what's running on the host so containers um, i shouldn't be too verbose because time is flying but uh, containers are also used by uh, a lot in uh, to deploy web servers you know so let's say uh, that you're deploying an http server to serve web pages uh, it's a very good idea to put it in a container so that, for instance, if it gets attacked, if it gets compromised, which happens a lot with H HTTP servers, with web servers, then the attackers would end up in a container isolated from the rest of the world. Okay. Um, still no questions. Okay, so, right. Um, so now only the processes are visible. Um, there is still, though, uh, something important that we. Sorry, I'm struggling a bit with a chat window. So something important that we don't um, that we still share with the host, and this is the CPU and memory. Okay, so um, I think I have an example here. Um, yeah. So so you know resources such as CPU and memory are still shared with the host. Uh, so if I'm using resources from inside my container, it will use resources that would otherwise be allocated to the host. Um, we could play uh, one step further with uh, network with uh, namespaces. So namespaces can actually be used to isolate other things than uh, just processes, and in particular network. Um, so you see from from my container um, I can actually still access the network so if I use the ping command which is which is a command used to um, to to send you know a unit network packet to a remote server I can see from my container that if I ping this IP address which I believe is the IP of google.ca 
uh, maybe it's not, but anyway, it's uh, the IP of uh, some server out there, <laughs> um, not a local one. And if I do that, you can see that I'm actually, you know, sending ping works as expected. So I'm sending packets, I'm receiving network packets from inside my container, which means that my container can actually access the network, you know, provided by my, by my laptop, by my host. So if you don't like that, like for instance, if you're starting, I don't know, some kind of application on your cluster uh, or on your server, it's containerized, it will run on your behalf and you don't want this application to leak out your precious data or you don't want it to try to do, you know, uh, network accesses. So you can block that just by adding this N option uh, to our unshare command. And what this does is that it creates another namespace but for the network. So now the network becomes unshared with the container. So again, I need to do that. And now, oops, oh yeah, sorry. I didn't type that wrong, that right. So there you go. So now I'm back in my container, but if I ping, if I try to ping that IP address, it will say that the network is unreachable because it has been unshared uh, from the host. Okay, and you can go through, you know, the man pages of uh, Unshare and, you know, other, you can find other examples online. Man pages, by the way, are uh, manual, it stands for manual. They are really the primary source of documentation. So often, you know, I mean, the way I work is that I would often Google things around, look for initial examples. And then, you know, when I want to read more about things, I would read the man pages or at least skim through them, let's be realistic. And, uh, and so the man page of Unshare, uh, the manual page would, uh, you know, explain you what are the other things that you can unshare and, and how essentially to, you know, you can further isolate processes from the host. Okay, so now we have a container that cannot use the network, a container that um, um, cannot uh, see the, the processes of the host a container that runs in a different root directory from the host. Important notes before we proceed, uh, we're still talking to the same kernel, okay? And that's an important thing. You may want to keep this in mind. It will, uh, uh, you know, help you identify bugs that you may have in your containers. If I run uname minus a here, I'm still running Linux. I'm still, I still have the same host name, which actually can be changed, but that's, let's say, a detail at this point. But more importantly, I'm still running the same kernel and with the same version as I had before in my host. And that's uh, maybe something that you want to keep in mind. It's a big difference with virtual machines like, you know, the ones you would start with VirtualBox. Uh, I haven't actually rebooted a, contain, uh, um, a computer here. You know, I'm still running on the system, on the Linux kernel that was booted when my laptop booted, when my laptop started. So in particular, that means that, you know, if, um, if, a, if an application requires a specific version of the kernel, which is rare, but can happen, um, containers are not going to help because containers do not bring the kernel with them. You know, they are just, as you understood, they are just a bunch of system calls which are deployed on an existing running kernel. Okay, so one step further uh, in our marker, um, you know, container engine construction. Um, that's something that I mentioned before, but um, we, we, are, we are still sharing memory and CPU with the host. And, and that's something that we may not want. Uh, typically, you know, you run your containerized analysis, you, you, you want to be able to say, look, you know, maybe I have eight gigs of RAM on my computer, but I also have other things to do. And I would appreciate if you could only use two gigs of RAM, you know, for the analysis so that I can keep six gigs to do something else. Um, and same for this, the same goes for the CPU. So this is important when running on your laptop, of course, but this is also increasingly important when running on an HPC system where memory and CPU are really uh, the key resources. So um, HPC admins use that feature a lot to um, essentially isolate processes in their own uh, resource space. 
And uh, that's done with uh, another sorry, feature of Linux called C groups. C groups are control groups. Um, so that's the third important concept and last that we'll see today, uh, con important concept related to container. So after ch roots and namespaces, C groups are used to isolate resources. So to illustrate that, we'll start by um, creating, so here it's just a fancy command to create a text file, really a random text file. Um, so that's going to be a text file of 100 megabytes uh, that I will create in my container roots. Okay, so I'm doing that. You don't really have to figure that out, that's fine. Uh, but the important thing is that um, I have now, so now I'm on the host and I have a file which is 96 uh, megabytes, maybe bytes, I guess. Anyway, so it's close to 100 megabytes and it's located in my container image. So if I look here, now I'm back to the container, the file exists and it's 100 megs. Now we're going to load it in memory, to load this file in memory. So, you know, you can pretend that this file is, for instance, an ephemeral sequence with a few volumes. And, you know, so you can pretend that it's a data file. And now we are going to write a program that will read this data file uh, from disk. And where does it read it to? Well, to memory. Um, so the simplest way to do this in Bash, I don't want to have to actually write a, a program is to just this cat this file and put the content of cat in a bash variable that I, I call a here. So it will force bash to create a variable and put the content of the file in that variable, which will use memory. So if I do that in my container, and this is supposed to be working. Yep, it worked, it took a while, but it worked. So now I have a variable called a, it's a bit ugly. Um, Maybe I shouldn't have done that, but you know, the, the content of the file is in memory. It's in A. If I echo this variable, it takes a while and then it display my random uh, file with 96 million characters. That's not, maybe I should have, I shouldn't have done that, okay. So that means that my container is still free to use 100 megs of, of RAM and actually it's, it's, it's not limited by anything. So it's still free to use whatever amount of RAM is available on the system. Um, okay, so we did that. Um, now we are going to restrict that. We are going to create a C group, a control group that we will call my group. So that's, I'm, yeah, I'm going to exit that container I'm going to create that control group called my group, but it could really, and it will control only memory, but we can use it also to control CPU if we want. And we're going to set a memory limit on this control group. So again, you know here, essentially what that does in the back end, it calls the system, it's system calls provided by Linux. So I set my C group to allow for only 10 megabytes. And uh, so now there is a C group out there, uh, but you know, it's not used for anything. So with this comment, I will run my same container, uh, except that I will now run it from the C group using the C group. So now this container, and that's going to be our last, the last version of our, of our container engine, Mercury, Mercury version 0.3, it's exactly the same comment as before. You recognize the ch root, you, rec you recognize the end share, but now I run it from the C group that controls my memory. So here am I, and uh, the file, the large file, file.txt, my data file is still here. And if I try now to read that file, so using the same trick as before, so I just you know display that file and put the content of it in a, in a variable, this crashes actually because it tries to use more memory than it's available. My C group only has 10 megabytes of memory, only allows for 10 megabytes of memory. My file, my file is 96 megabytes. So this is an out of memory error and my process gets killed by the system because it's exceeded its, uh, its quotas. Of course, in real life, you would like to have quotas which are a bit larger than um, 10 megabytes, but you get the idea. 
Okay. Um, so yeah, as a conclusion, um, so we have built uh, a small container engine that's based on ch root namespaces and c groups. These are really the system calls uh, which are used, you know, by Docker and Singularity. So Docker and Singularity are just wrappers. I mean, heavy wrappers, but still wrappers around these concepts. Uh, there's a few other things, uh, you know, that uh, I thought I wouldn't uh, bother you with for today, but which are also important. Um, one is overlay file systems. So actually, for those of you who are playing with Docker, you may have realized that Docker, like a Docker image is actually built in layers. So typically you would start from a base image, let's say a base OS, maybe CentOS, Ubuntu, Alpine Linux, whatever. And on top of that, you would add extra files. You know, perhaps you would install first some system packages using apt install. Then you would install FSL. Then you would install other things, you know. So there is a way, a way to combine, you know, different layers of file systems into one. And that's called uh, overlay file systems. You can check that in, in the manual page of uh, the mount command. If you search for overlay, Mm -hmm. It will, uh, uh, you know, explain you details about that. And the second thing is sec, sorry, sec comp. It's um, it's another feature of the Linux kernel used by Docker and Singularity to limit system calls that the process is allowed to do. So, for instance, you could say, you know, that you don't want a container to be able to uh, write any file, if that if that makes sense, because you know. You don't want it to the container to mess up with your disk, or to exec execute anything else than you know was initially executed. So there's a way to limit that using setcom. Okay, um, maybe I can spend uh, before I have a, a quick game to finish this presentation. But before we move into that, maybe I could take uh, questions if there are any. Does this work completely differently on Windows? That's a good question. So, um, okay, you understood indeed that containers are really bound, tightly bound to Linux, okay? They are coming from namespaces and C groups, which were developed in Linux, by Linux, for Linux. So, um, containers on Mac and the Mac and Windows kernel systems are not able to do that, don't provide C groups on namespaces. So the way uh, containers are implemented there is actually that they start a virtual machine, a light virtual machine, but still a virtual machine. So a complete virtual machine, uh, as in virtual box or, you know, I didn't really cover that, but I guess Pear uh, two weeks ago mentioned the difference between virtual machines and containers. So they start a Linux virtual machines, machine, uh, lightweight ones, but still a virtual machine. And then they start containers from inside the virtual machine. So it works completely differently in the sense that, uh, I mean, yes and no. Yes, in the sense that containers can't work natively on Windows. No, in the sense that actually the way containers work on Windows is that they actually run in a Linux system. So the principles are the same. Where, where, what are the typical situations where you want to use a container? So, um, okay, um, I refer you to the really the great slide that Pear had um, uh, prepared for two weeks ago. Um, so, um, I guess in our own context, um, there, there, I would say there are two main situations. One is that um, you want to be able to easily package your 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 analysis. You know, to one is portability. Okay, so you have an analysis, a piece of software, maybe with some data, I don't know, you know, so you have, you have software written maybe in Python, maybe in C, maybe in MATLAB, in whatever you want. It's a hot mess and you want to facilitate the installation of this software by other people. In that case, it's a good idea to package your software in a container image 
a Docker one, I would say, uh, so that people can just pull that image, deploy it, don't have to think about anything about installation and just run stuff. So that makes your analysis portable. The second thing, the second use case, um, I think is reproducibility in our world anyway. I'm not talking about web deployment, management, uh, all that, you know, I'm, I'm talking really about um, um, data analysis in your imaging. So second use case would be reproducibility. You have an analysis, you know, there's a way for people to run it, but you're just afraid that it won't give the same results if you deploy it differently. Okay, typically you have a paper, you want people to reproduce the figures in a paper, to be able to reproduce the figures in a paper, and you don't want, you know, um, the figures to not work because people have installed a more recent version or have an older version of Matplotlib, let's say, or, you know, have updated their FSL version and what worked with FSL version X doesn't work anymore with FSL version Y. So then, you know, providing, releasing a, virtual, um, a container image helps people uh, reproduce what, what you've done without question tasks. I uh, hope it answers your question, Francois. Uh, follow up on David's question. Thanks, so containers end up being much heavier in Windows and Mac then. Um, and then I read the rest of your question. So um, yes, absolutely. Uh, it defeats a bit the purpose actually of containers to have to run them in virtual machines. I uh, just wanted to say, um, it skipped my mind, but um, um, I've heard, although I haven't checked it, I've heard that uh, Windows at least uh, was able now to support containers natively. So it's possible that recent evolution, evolutions in Windows uh, provide ways to you know, implement namespaces and C groups. I haven't checked that. So to be followed up, I guess. Workflow questions, if you're starting an analysis from scratch, would you do your work in a container from the beginning or would you containerize it once you've started out, or once you've sorted out what you're doing? Good question. Um, Depends what you're doing and how proficient you are with containers, but uh, I would say it's a good idea to start uh, from scratch. Uh, in particular, if you anticipate that you will have to install a lot of libraries, you know, so essentially the, you know, um, a common workflow is one, I need to use that program. Two, I spend half a day installing all kind of libraries and making it work on my computer. Three, oh shit, I need to do that on a cluster. I need to repeat that installation work. So if you, if you anticipate that one installation will be a bit tricky, two, you may want to reproduce that on a different computer. Would it be your own computer at home? Would it be a cluster? Would it be the lab server? Would it be the computer of your lab mate? Um, then, then I would say just start from a container from the get-go. It's way easier. And if you're using Docker, I really recommend to use even a Docker file from the get-go because it helps you document what you're doing. Um, I'd just like to amend that in one small way, which is that I think it really depends on what type of tools you're using too. So for instance, if I have a project that I'm developing or working on or trying to use that is just like a Python library, um, what I'll often do instead is I'll have like a requirements.txt file that defines exactly what versions I have. And then all I have to do is pip install that on a new machine. Um, so I think it really depends on like the weight of what you're doing, because if, for instance, I needed to run free server or FSL or something like that, that actually is a much heavier installation than, you know, pip install pandas. Um, yes, I 100% of the time use containers, but for light things, I think it's just recognize, uh, important to recognize like the lower bound of when it's just a waste of resources to, to bother spinning up a container. I couldn't agree more with that. Okay, so follow-up question from David. One of the reasons I'm asking is I'm not sure how to use non-command line tools in a container like Jupyter Notebooks. Okay, so there are two, okay, maybe three elements to that. So first of all, you don't necessarily have to run Jupyter inside the container. You know, you could just run um, things from Jupyter to a container. So you could call the container from the Jupyter notebook, the Jupyter notebook. So, you know, in the cells, you could run, you could use Docker run and then run something in a container instead of running it directly. 
Um, that's, you know, and that's general for other applications. Uh, second thing, there might be a Jupyter Notebook uh, extension or, you know, thing to integrate seamlessly in a container. I haven't checked that out, but maybe someone else here uh, has an idea about it. And the third thing is that anyway, from, from a container, you can start non-command line applications. You have to, uh, you have to share your, your, um, your display socket with the host. So there is a, I could post that on Slack after the, after the call, but, um, but there is a way to do that with Docker. So you can run Firefox or whatever from within the container and have it export its display to your, to your host. Maybe a fourth answer to that is that it's also possible to, to network. So you could start, yeah, maybe for notebooks, it's actually easier. You could start a notebook from inside a container and then you see how actually uh, I'm connected to the notebook through, through the browser. Well, we could do the same thing and connect to the container. So we could start a notebook in the container and then open a browser that would now point to a container, to the container. I'm sure you'll find more documentation online, but I could help to for doing that if you want. Okay, so uh, we are a bit uh, out of time already. Um, I guess we are taking a bit on the um, on the coffee break, but I, I wanted to conclude with that game of flashcards because I think it's both fun and interesting. Uh, so maybe I'll use a few minutes on, for that. Feel free to leave if you, you know, uh, if you want. Sorry for being late. But so these flashcards are another project from Julia Evans. Another great project. Uh, these ones are on containers, but uh, she has other ones for other technologies too. And I find them a good way to, you know, learn things. And actually I, I learned a lot by, just by reading flash, uh, her flashcards. Okay, so maybe I'll go through the first ones and then you can continue for yourself if you want. So uh, first one, so it, it comes in the, you know, in the form of a, a small quiz. Um, what can a Docker container do by default if you run it on your laptop? Can it connect to the internet? Can it access files on your laptop? Or, or can it see what programs you have running? Okay. So as we learned today, um, it's by default anyway, it's not going to be possible for a container to access files on your laptop because you have completely wiped out the root directory and replaced it with a container image. So of course it's possible to access files. You can use mounts, it's option um, dash V in Docker. So it's possible, but by default, unless you use that option, you're not going to be able to access files on your laptop. Um, see what programs you have running. Well, as we learned today, no, uh, we are running in a different process namespace. So by default, we are, uh, we are not going to be able to see the programs which I'm running on my laptop. So it must be connect to the internet. And I believe that's the answer. Yep, only connect to the internet, cool. Um, and, um, and so, yeah, you remember that in my version two uh, of Marker, I could still connect to the internet in 2.1, I disabled that uh, capability. So it's possible to restrict network connection, but by default in Docker, if you don't do anything, uh, network is available. So let me go through the next one. Oops, yeah, I learned something. Okay, is it possible to run a database in a container? No, or yes. Answer is sure, I don't see why not. Uh, you can see, yeah, you can run anything in a container. It's very common, mostly for people doing, you know, DevOps and um, web server deployment or infrastructure deployments to run databases. But in your work, if you have a database or fancy piece of service, of course you can run it in a container. Uh, I'm thinking now in particular, yeah, in bioinformatics, there's a lot of databases, uh, you know, sometimes you have to start Postgres or MySQL, you can definitely do that in a container. Okay, maybe we'll do another two. Is a container a type of virtual machine? Okay, so that's a 
that's a tricky question because virtual machine is um, is uh, it's is broadly defined. So I would say actually I can't remember the answer of that flashcard, but I would say strictly speaking, no, a container is not a virtual machine. If you refer to a virtual machine, like you know. Um, the, the, um, the booting of a new system on an existing host, then no, the container doesn't boot a new machine. It's not a complete machine. It just provides the illusion that we're on a, not a virtual machine by isolated processes and files. Now, if we, will, if we refer to virtualization in a broader sense, well, containers are, are considered an OS level, so virtualization at the level of the operating system. You could also consider that your Python virtual environment is a virtual machine which operates, you know, in the environment level. Uh, Conda, I think Pear mentioned that two weeks ago, Conda can also be considered a virtual machine. So my answer would be traditionally no, but in a broader sense, yes. No, okay, so that's a traditional answer. VMs each have a completely separate operating system. Okay, I'll take a final one. I don't, I don't want to bother you too much with that. You can do that for yourself. So final one, uh, card number four. Oh, that's an easy one. Can you run a Red Hat container on a Ubuntu system? So Red Hat and Ubuntu are two different Linux distributions. You should make a difference, a distinction between, you know, a, a distribution of Linux and the, the Linux kernel itself. Okay, a distribution is everything on my computer, which is not the kernel. So typically my terminal, you know, the graphical user interface, the LS, the LS command, the CD command, the MKDR, this is all part of the distribution. And Red Hat and Ubuntu are two different types of Linux distributions. So of course you can run a Red Hat container on a Ubuntu system um, as long as the kernels are compatible. So as long as the Ubuntu, the kernel that comes with Ubuntu would still work with Red Hat. But the kernel is developed in a way that it's extremely rare, um, you know, that, um, that you have incompatibilities like this. So they, they really try hard to not break what they call user space. So in general, what's, run, what's running on a kernel would run on a different kernel. So the answer is yes. On Linux, your OS has two parts, the kernel, the distribution. You can run a different distribution in a container, but not on a different kernel. Okay, it's 10 to 10 already, so I guess I'll stop here. Um, thanks for attending. I'm happy to take any other question either here or on Slack uh, during the day.